So you could not predict, and I, I could have predicted the answer to that question. You can't predict. I mean, none of us know exactly what the path is. But could you describe for us what your path was? Take us through your career up to this point. So my path was very circuitous. I came here to study journalism. I was getting a, a specialization in magazine writing. And then I was getting a minor in zoology because I wanted to work for National Geographic. I grew up reading National Geographic from a very young age. I kind of had a feeling that the world was much more than what I could see in my immediate surroundings. So I thought, if I do this, 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 I can become part of this organization. <clears throat> my uh, 
but I'm from Panama. Even though I went to a primary elementary school, middle school, and high school that taught me English, the English that they teach you in school like that is not colloquial English. It's not the real deal. It's you know it's not until you get to where they all speak English that you realize, wait a second. I mean, I don't have to use all those proper grammar words and like. So the point is, when it's when it comes to writing, you need to be a master of the language in order to properly write to journalism. So in my very first class, introduction to journalism writing, my professor was also my advisor. Her name was Helen Miller. <coughs> And uh, she was so tough that for every mistake that you made, she took away 50 points. And it got to a point that I would start a test and she'd be like, you owe me from 50 from the last time. <laughs> so it was embarrassing. I was, uh, you know, I, I was really struggling. So she finally pulled me aside and said, this is really hard for you. What, what are you doing here? I said, well, I want to become, I want to work for extra traffic, blah, 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 blah. She said, oh, okay. And then one day she calls me to her and says, you know, the director of the dark of the geographic, which is also an alumni of the college, Tom Kennedy, is coming to talk to photo students. You should go have dinner with them. He's like, no, I know nothing of photography. I don't want to go. He said, you're going. She made me go. God bless powerful women. <laughs> <laughs> Send you to the right path. So, I, you know, it was eight photo students and I, and I completely dominated the conversation because I didn't have the knowledge of how important this guy was. But because of that, I was very candid in my approach. You know, I, I didn't count out to him or anything like that to me. It's just a guy that I could ask a lot of questions. So I told him, hey, 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 so I'm studying this, 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 so I can work for you guys. What are the odds? He's like, none. You have better chances if you were a photographer. I'm like, okay, I'll become a photographer. As simple as that. As, you know, lucky chance of meeting someone. And what they, what they said kind of resonated with me. I made a decision in the spot. And I told him, okay, I will become a photographer. He's just looking at me sideways. He's like, okay. Trying to pay attention to the eight people that didn't know about photography. And, uh, and I said, okay, so what's next? He said, what do you mean? I'm like, well, how, what do I do? What's, I'm going to be a photographer. How do I work for you guys? He's like, I don't know. I guess you could apply for the internship. I'm like, all right, how do I do that? He's like, the deadline is in December. We're in August. I'm like, perfect. And, uh, and then I excused myself. I went into the to the restaurant's manager's office, I asked for to borrow a pencil and paper, and I can draw. So I drew a caricature of him sitting on top of the wall, and it was him like Rodin Stinker, saying, Tom Kennedy, National Geographic, the world is our backyard. And I signed it, and I dated it, and I made a couple of copies of it, and I gave it to him. I came back, I gave it to him, I said, the next time you see this, my portfolio is going to be attached. So he said, right. <laughs> so I came out of that meeting with the thirst of knowledge. And, and, and I really started messing with this guy, Professor Freeman, because I was all questions, questions, questions. I want to know how do you do this. So I wanted to go beyond the others between him and a local nature photographer by the name of Charlie Jarman. Sadly enough, I kind of lost track of him. I learned a lot. And I was able to put a portfolio together, mostly in wildlife, whatever that big drug lord estates down in South Florida would get raided. All the exotic animals would be sent up here hmm. in the area. So I was able to have in my portfolio of lions and tigers and wolves. So one day I'm walking by Professor Aller's office and she's like, come here, come here. I heard you've been working really hard on this portfolio. Can I see it? Back in the day, the only way to present a portfolio was a big board and it was light film and you could only crop it with silver tape and an exacto knife, so paint. So I give this to her. She's looking and says, oh, this is, this is, this is interesting. Uh, when do you turn it in? I'm like, ah, you know what? The more I learn about the graphic and photography, the more I realize I should have never talked to that guy that way. It was ludicrous and I'm embarrassed. She's like, hmm, let me keep it anyhow. January comes about. She pulls me out of the, one of my classes. She says, I've got somebody in the phone for you. And uh, she gives me the phone. It's like, hey, Estrus, this is Tom Kennedy, the geographic. I'm like, hold on. What did you do? <laughs> She's like, shut up, talk to the man. He's like, hey, Estrus, you have a lot of potential. You're not there by any means. You have potential, and I need somebody who speaks Spanish and English, knows a bit about animals, knows a bit about photography. He basically described me. I need somebody who works as an assistant for a couple of my photographers on assignment in Central America, Panama, Costa Rica, and Colombia. And I'm like, that's great. He says, but it's a last minute decision, so I can only pay you $50 a day. I'm like, you would have paid me at the position? I would have done it for free. I would have sold a kidney to have done that. So I had that experience. And if I got two great photos out of it, it was just sheer luck.
because I didn't know what I was doing. But the experience itself told me that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Like it cemented my path. So that's that's pretty much how it started. That's how it went. That's how it's going. I forgot he asked me. I get so caught up in that story. I forget. So uh, we've got a room full of students here. Everybody here, I'm going to assume, is you're you know you're, you're looking. Graduation's not too far off. Like, what am I going to do? Can I follow my dreams? Can I be happy? Um, and I always, when I was in that position, I always looked to people in the field and and wanted to know what can I get from you? What information can I get from you that's going to help? Me. So do you have some advice, whether it's standard advice or specific to our, our gators here? Just like I told Gracie in that interview I just had, uh, the, be the first thing is, somebody told me this, this is not mine. Give yourself the assignment you want someone else to give you. And this is not only about the dark. This could be a story if you're a writer. This could be a, a whole essay, a documentary. I mean, just get it started. There will always be all the other reasons for you not to get started because it's too hard. They will always be there. But by the same token, they're all the same reasons why you can get it going. It's a matter of whether you focus on the negative or whether you focus on the positive, the path that you will take. There will always be naysayers. There will always be people telling you, you cannot do that because you don't have the resources. Guess what? People do that every day. People do insurmountable tasks that, that sound impossible and they pull it off. And you got to get started. You know, being a witness to the world, to life, is not going to help you. Sadly, no. Our phones, they suck our lives. You know, we spend too much time vicariously enjoying. God, would, I wish I could tell you, enjoying great stories. No, we are hooked on entertainment. You know, our brains are just adult brains. So you need to kind of put the phone aside, unless you use it for a tool to tell a story, and actually start telling stories. And try to do it in the, in, in the most basic of things. It doesn't have to be extraordinary. That There's a misconception for young photographers that, oh, I want to go to Africa. So I can make great photos. No, no, go ahead. You if you don't make great photos in your own backyard, going to Africa or any exotic location is not going to give you great photos. You need to become a great photographer in your own backyard. You need to become a great storyteller in your own backyard before you can do it somewhere else. That's it. Get going. So in, in just a moment, I'm going to, I know that you've got some imagery that you want to share with us. And, um, but before we do that, I have one more question for you. Uh, because I know that we learn a lot of times by, uh, by non-examples of my errors and stuff. Do you look back on your career and you see any, what you might consider like a misstep or something, or a missed opportunity that you would oh, do yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I tell people that I am as good as I am because I have ruined hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of frames. That's one. Okay? And I've learned from my mistakes. But there are about, I don't know, five occasions of photos that I've missed that will haunt me for my, the rest of my life. And I keep going in my mind over and over over these instances to try to figure out what could I have done different not to have missed it. And we learn more from our mistakes and our failures than from our wins. If you are a successful athlete, if you always win, maybe because you're gifted naturally and you have great coaches, you're really not, you know, the day that you fail is going to be painful because you don't have that experience. So photography is great because the majority of photos you're going to make are awful, yeah, but every once in a while you catch glimpses of greatness. When you can start holding on to the greatness and you start understanding it, you can create, you can backtrack from that and then you can continue to produce it. So don't be afraid of making mistakes, you know, just keep moving forward. Winners are not the ones who always win, are the ones who fail and get up and how fast you get up and you readjust. Any football player, any basketball player will tell you the same. They always fail at some point, but you got to keep going. That's it. All right. Well, why don't we take this opportunity for you? And I, I don't know if you do. You want to stand up with Petcher? No, I have to stand up because my phone is not talking to my computer. Okay. So I have to do it the old way and actually stand up here. Um. So this is how long? How do you want? How long? Uh, it is a little afternoon right now, and I think if we go for 20 minutes or so, is that a couple of 20 or 25? Yeah, you guys got to tell me with the 20 minutes because once I start showing. Forward, I'll let you know. We'll follow. We'll give 10 minutes. All right. So. Yeah. All right. So this. It's actually sort of a chronological order of my career, so don't think much of it. Uh, not every photo is perfect for the stories they tell, the moments that they capture, is what makes it impactful. And I hope you agree. Also, I do not mind being interrupted. I'd rather you ask me a question while I have a photo there, because it tells me that you're engaged. It tells me that, that I'm not boring the bejesus out of you. 
and that you're interested. So please, by all means, just raise your hand and just let me know, you know, make noises, stand up, do whatever you, you know. guy with a cool hair, just flip that hair. I'm really jealous, by the way. I used to have hair. <laughs> but anyhow, and I keep our hat just because it shines otherwise against all the lights. That's it. All right. Remember, um, so the Os Osdelis journey story, I was talking about this one specific photo. And this is three days I followed the body of this 14-year-old migrant boy who was being uh, taken, the body was being taken back to its native village of Cucuna in the border of Mexico and Guatemala. And this photo I shot from a valley, and uh, it's blown up, it's shot with film. And people, and this was the first opening of the essay, and people would see this photo and they say, wow, you're amazing. You, you thought in advance that you needed a photo in order to move forward that story. And no, 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 in reality, I was leaning against the tree throwing up. So I had been awake for like three days, I had no energy. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> And I had, this is how I got the shot. But the point is, I needed to do my job. So you just become single-minded with focus and getting it done, and you get it done. This is the photo that after I ran after that, and they had opened the, the box, this is what I walked into. And uh, before making this photo, I have covered so many funerals, and I hate it. And to this day, I dislike covering funerals. But the moment I took this photo, I understood why I had covered all these funerals. It's just that when I had something extraordinary in front of me, I would recognize it as such. This is the first time I took a photo that I understood that it was synergistic, that it was much more than the photo that I made, that the impact that it, you know, I, did, I couldn't voice it clearly what it was, but I knew the first time in my life I took a photo that I'm like, oh wow, this is amazing. And the whole situation was very overwhelmingly powerful. And it was very touching that these people, when, they, when I walked in and there were people in front of me, I, I didn't want to just push my way to the front because it would be disrespectful. But they saw me and they opened up and they kind of pushed me to the front just so I could document because they understood that somebody from afar, abroad, had come to document that moment and they let me in. So as a storyteller, being privy to things like this, it is a privilege and you should never forget that. Never ever assume that you have the right to do this kind of thing unless people allow you to, especially if it's one of the most private moments. If anything, thinks about what if your loved ones die and a journalist gets a camera in your face, how would you feel about that? And this is the other part of that story. The kid, this kid right here, he helped dig the hole where the body will be buried. And uh, in the background, what you see there is the border of Guatemala and Mexico. The, the mountains in the background are Mexico. So this is the town really at the border. And I asked this kid, what are you going to do when you grow up? He said, I'm going to cross to the Norte. That story keeps repeating itself. So this story is still relevant to this day. Right. Now we are in Columbine. I only put a few photos of Columbine. But Columbine was very, it's the first time in my life where I was exposed to this degree of pain. It, it, it's kind of hard to describe when you're covering a scene like this, but eventually the ambience becomes heavy. There's a, there's a weariness, weariness and a just gloom that is oppressive. And so I, I spent about seven, eight days covering the aftermath. And you get this kind of scenes. The, the cars of all the kids uh, die, were left in the parking lot. They became impromptu memorials where people would drop flowers and that kind of stuff. And this is the photo that was part of the Pulitzer. This is one of, he's the one African American that was killed during the, during the shooting. His name was Isaiah Scholes. He was a senior. And uh, in there you can actually see the diploma he was gotten. And uh, I have a whole sequence where she's walking in front of the casket and his face had been completely reconstructed. They put a gun to his face and just blew it up. So he looked like a mannequin. And at that moment, I actually had, for a very brief moment, I thought of not photographing that because it was too graphic, because he looked like a doll, like a mannequin. But I, I decided not, and eventually that became a rule that I follow. I never stop myself from making a photo because whether it's going to be published or not, I let someone else decide that, but I will have the photo. So what made this photo work so well is that the, not only does she have the body in the background, the diploma, the program in her hand, but those are columbines in her hand. So we told the whole story of the shooting of Um uh, One of these young women, young students that were killed, her name is Rachel Scott, and she became famous because apparently one of the shooters put a gun to her head and said, are you ready to die? And she said something along the lines, I believe in God, I am. And he killed her. So she became a cause celebre. And uh, about a month after, she, after the events in Columbine, my boss called me and said, we, today's Rachel Scott's. Uh, birthday, 
and we heard that her dad is going to go place flowers at her grave site. And I was like, geez, do we still have to go do this? Do we leave this? Give him a break. Like, I thought we were just pushing too much, but my boss was like, you got to go. It's the first time in my life where I didn't just follow an order straight up, but instead of going from point A to point B in a straight line, I am there all over the city because I didn't want to do this. I didn't. And I got there, and when I got there, I looked at the grave site, and there was a, a car from her dad, so he'd been there. I missed it. I'm like, right, I missed it. So I'm about to call the office, and as I'm walking away, this young woman starts coming my way, and I thought she was looking at me, but no, she was looking past me. She was looking at the grave site. And when she went by, I noticed that her t-shirt had Rachel's photo. So I ran to the car, pulled out a big lens that I had with me. I came back. I stood in the open. I never hide when I take photos. And I made a sequence of this photo. I got low on one knee, and I made the photo. And then I backed away. Then the hardest part came, which was I needed to wait in the parking lot so I could talk to her. Because you cannot present this photo and not have a name. So I, I am like, I am so sorry for interrupting this moment. But I'm with a Rocky Mountain News, and uh, would you mind giving me your name? Literally, this is my tone. I, this, I'm that shy about it. And she gave it to me and, and surprised me. And then that is the day that I realized that we, as human beings, we carry with us something that I call sin lease, self-imposed limitation. In my mind, I already had come up with a conclusion. We need to learn to disregard that and keep moving forward. A lot of people are going to tell you no, a lot of people are going to be mad, but a lot of people, are, most people are not going to be that upset about it. So, By the way, you guys are not asking questions, <laughs> which worries me. All right, then, I, then uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to cover a war because I thought as a photojournalist I needed to cover a war. So I begged to go to uh, Iraq and I finally got to go. And I learned, one of the first, first things that I learned is that young people are the ones that fight wars. It's not the people that make the decisions. They're usually in the safety of their offices making decisions while young people like this 19-year-old are in the front lines. Just to show you what I, I don't know if I was, God, isn't badass? <laughs> I just said it. What a badass this kid was is we are being shot at from across the river. I am shooting from below, not because I have the wherewithal to know that that's the best possible composition at the moment, but it's but he's like, ah, AK-47 won't make it accurate across the river. I'm like, Good for you, dude. I'm staying down here. So, but it's a kid. You know, it's, it's a kid. It's a kid. And uh, I... One of my fellow photographers at Rocket Man News told me, whenever you think you have a great story in front of you, make that shot, but then turn around to see what's behind you. So the tanks were going by. There was a cavalcade of, of tanks, British tanks, going by, and uh, of Allied forces, and I got those shots, which were pedestrian. Because if you think about it, other than the fact that they're tanks in a row, there's nothing exciting about it. I just duplicated what I could see. I blinked with my equipment. I had no merit. But I remember that advice, and I looked behind, and there was a little sentry place that had been shot up to hell. So I ran inside, and I caught the last tank as it goes by, and then the photo became much more interesting, because now we have a story that is being told. We have layers of information. Now you're much more engaged with what's going on. So these guys are Ordnance Retrieval Detachment. <coughs> Their job is to go around and pick up unexploded bombs. And uh, so I'm trying, I'm so focused on getting the silhouette, I'm putting the sunburst in the right place, and I'm down on my knees. Oh, by the way, I, I, I tend to shoot from the ground because the easiest way to clean the background is to shoot against the sky. Most of the time, the sky is empty, so that's my spot. And uh, so I'm down there making this photo, I know I got it, and I'm like, guys, dude, you are so brave doing this thing. It's like, no more than you? What do you mean? I'm right down. I was so focused on what I was doing that I didn't realize I was kneeling on a bunch of unexploded ordnance. So, and you know, the, what makes a story powerful, it's the human beings that are part of the story. So we were the first team of journalists who actually going to Sadr City. Sadr City is the biggest, uh, they called it a slum, I thought it was just a neighborhood. Uh, and, and Saddam was Sunni. The majority of the country was Shia. He kept the Shia oppressed. And uh, so we're going by this neighborhood that nobody had gone in because we didn't talk to the journalist because they had blockades everywhere and they had people with guns and it was intimidating. And one day we happened to be at a light and I look and there's an old man and he's got a gun and I look at him and I'm like, and he smiled and he put his gun down. I'm like, stop the car, stop the car. So we went with a translator and we explained and he invited us in and we ended up in interviewing these people. And uh, this woman, her name was Fatima. She had shrapnel in her face 
from the mortar shell that three days prior had killed three of her five children. So this is one of those situations where the camera, this is technical, the camera is telling me there's no way you can get, I'm coming to you, thank you. There's no way I can actually get this photo because it's too dark. So I braced myself, held my breath, and with a telephoto, this is like one eighth of a second at 2.8, as much as the camera can handle, and I made the photo, but it's a very powerful photo. You have a question. Yes, how did you like mentally and emotionally deal with everything that you so the question is, how do I mentally and emotionally deal with all it? Turns out that I'm very good at compartmentalizing <laughs> my feelings. I want to generalize here. Men, we're not as advanced as women are. <laughs> Your brains are much more complex. Your communication pathways are always open. I've been married for 31 years. I know this. My wife tells me we're a lesser version of the species, and I believe it. <laughs> I truly believe it. So I, we put things in little holes, and we're like, we don't deal with them unless somebody asks me. So, and when I went to Iraq, I had volunteered for it. I knew two months in advance that I was going to be there. So I spent three months out there. I came back. And after a couple of months, um, I was, and the paper had offered to send me to therapy if I wanted, if I felt like I needed it. Of course, I said, no, I'm a guy. I'm a Muslim. So uh, two months later, my wife is like, you got to go to the doctor. I'm like, why? What did I do? She's like, nothing. That's why you need to go. Because you, I see your photos. I see your outtakes. I see everything that you saw, you documented. And you're okay. That's not normal. So I dragged myself to the therapist. And the therapist explained about the compartment lights. And that's one. And he said the other thing was, I actually had time to psychologically prepare for it. Because I, you know, I knew that I was coming. I had volunteered. And he said, the best way I can, I can explain, this, explain this to you is, if somebody has a relative, a loved one, that has a terminal disease, when they die, you're very sad. You're heartbroken. But you understand. And you expect it. But if you leave your house in the morning and you kiss your loved ones, bye, see you in the afternoon, see you at night, and they never come back, say so we're in a tragic accident, that will shred your life apart because you're not mentally ready for that. And that is the difference. So ever, and eventually you just get good at dealing. I, I don't think, I just go. I hear shots, I pick up my camera and run into them. Lack of common sense, lesser version of the species, call it what you make. That's a great question. So, I'm, I am hanging out with a Dragoon something, British detachment of soldiers. By the way, that's back in the day, that's a bazooka, javelin, they used to call it. I think now they have modern versions of that. Um, so, they're getting fired from the end of the street this way, so they're behind sandbags. And I am over here, and I'm trying to get the shot, tell the story, but one frame at a time is kind of hard. I needed to put that street in perspective. Then this little kid with Alibaba pants just comes and stands there and smiles. I'm like, oh crap, then the kid can do it, I can do it. So I came around, I made a couple of shots, and like, kid, Imshi, Imshi, Imshi. And she's like, go, go, go. And uh, then the kid went away. But, you know, sometimes you kind of got to get out of your own head to get things done. The kid showed me the way. Remember when I told you we interviewed these people, this is the same situation. As a, as, as a visual person, and I apologize to all the writers, but when we go to an interview, and, we, and you go with a photographer or a visual person, we're just documenting a talking head. It's really hard to make a good photo. Interviews go forever and you're on your knees, you're like, oh my God, what else can I photograph? But these people, at some point they get asked something about what did they think about the Americans and coalition forces. And they had already put their guns down to talk to us. And all of a sudden, I see a movement, I pick up my camera and I start pointing down. And they say, with these very same weapons that we defend ourselves from Saddam, Fedarin forces, we will defend against the invaders. And that was very prophetic because the war continue for many, many years actively, and it's still sort of going, so. So the point of that is, you cannot let your guard down. So even in the midst of being bored, I, you know, I just don't have to keep it up. Um, aftermath of a bomb attack and an alleged Saddam hiding, kind of, one would call this yellow journalism in the sense of the, a child, a doll, and a whole bomb. That's not, that's a fact. They kill, but they kill like 17 people on, a, on an attack. Of, on civilians because they thought that Saddam was there. That's called collateral damage. So that's just telling the story. It's not, there's no, I didn't have any intention other than the fact to show it was there. Um, when I got arrived in Baghdad, because we were in a lateral, which means that we were not attached to a, to a company, military company, we were on our own, so we got to decide where to go. And right before I turned back to the previous day, we got like a seven flat tire amongst a five car convoy. So we ended up not spending the night around this guy's 
And in the morning we hear commotion and it's just people asking for food, so that's the story of that. This is a face of frustration. When soldiers first went out there, there were not enough translators. And they get sent out to this bank because they heard that people were robbing the bank. And we, when we went inside, I have photos of a hole on the ground and they're like stacks of bills being carried away in wheelbarrows. I don't know where they went. Notice all these guys, they all look like Saddam Hussein. It's, it's a look they have. So but they're working with the American forces and they don't have a translator with them. They can't communicate. So I made this photo and then he looks at me and he looks behind me and my translator behind me and he says, can I borrow your translator? I'm like, you can't because the story is that you don't have translators. I am going to photograph for another 10 minutes and then I, you can have my translator and then I'm going to move away. But right now, you are the story because the futility of how this is being handled is the story. And you not having a translator is part of it. He didn't like it, but it was a fact. That, so I shot a little bit more and then I moved away and I told my translator to go. And then once that happens, I kind of step away because now I had affected that line of story. I created it, therefore I no longer can be ob objective about it. I never shy away from taking graphic photos. I have body parts, I have blown up bodies, I have rotted bloating corpses, but I, and I shot all of those, but I was looking for a way of telling the story that wasn't so graphic. So I found this body and I found this wallet. It turns out that after a firefight, American soldiers would go and pick the pockets of the, of the corpses, gather information, intel to know who they're fighting. So this guy, that could have been his son, his whatever, and that's a gym membership, which humanized the attacker. This is not just the enemy, this is a human being. One way of, when you're in a, in, in a, a theater of war, and one way of knowing casualties is you go to hospitals. It, part of your routine is at some point during the day you go to a hospital to find out how many dead, how many wounded. And this guy, while we were there, he was brought in on a sofa from his house because they couldn't move because he was in so much pain. He was in sepsis, full in sepsis, uh, infection with the blood. Uh, stories that he was at the, allegedly he was at a market and somebody stepped out of our car and they came for the and he got stitched up through the belly and uh, so they brought him in. Funny enough, I just, well, five years ago I was looking at a portfolio that I lived in of a photographer, AP photographer in Cuba and I was looking at his portfolio and I found the very same scene shot from a different angle and uh, he got the whole sequence, he got, the guy died eventually, he's the one who told me, I, didn't, I never knew what happened to this guy. So, um, this is in the, the day they were celebrating, commemorating the death of Ali. Ali was tortured for weeks on end, a lot of blood. So, what, what the Shia does is they cut themselves, what they rhythmically say, Ali, Ali. And they cut, they use knives, they cut, they use swords. And uh, it's kind of brutal. And, and at first I was shooting from afar, and then I saw two of the two of photojournalists that I admire. It was Jim Natchue and Ressa, and they were in the middle of it, and I thought, if they're there, I gotta go in there. So I actually went in there in the middle, and I got great photos of the whole thing. I, I just showed you one, but I have lots of photos where I'm surrounded by blades going, and there's blood everywhere. And when I walked away, my t-shirt was all covering with blood. I was kind of freaking out, like, but I did my job. Question. Question. Okay. Where? Well, in a situation like that, you could do it from afar, but you're not really... If, the great Robert Kappa used to say, if your photos are not good enough, you're not close enough, so you got to get close. So, in a situation like that, you inch your way and you keep assessing the situation. As long as you don't get threatened or you're, you're in danger or your team is in danger, you can keep moving forward. That's how you do it. You have to... Every situation needs to be assessed by its own conditions. You cannot... There are no flat statements that this is how you do it. Every single one needs to be assessed. So that's how I do it. By the way, so not everything that I cover was sad about the war. You know, you got soldiers coming back home, you know, young, young wife, celebration, the dog tax in the hands. So it was a beautiful photo. I was so excited to get this after I came back from Iraq because this was a good thing. So I graded it. By the way, this is called Hail Mary. Where you take your camera and you shoot from above. Before we had LCDs that came out that you could actually see what you were doing. Did the Hail Mary because it was a miracle that you got it. So that's a Hail Mary. And I was so excited about the photo. I never sent the right photo. The photo never saw the light of day. I sent the wrong photo. So people that see this person just the ones that see it. How are we doing the time? So we have about 12 minutes left in the Ooh, class. That's awesome.
That side has questions. That side has questions. You people, what's going on? Ah, okay. Did you ever face any opposition from the local police? Did you have to fight with you? Local authorities? Have I ever faced any opposition to local authorities? You, you, you best give them the wide spectrum, unless you know you have a contact that knows them. Better. Because you know, a little man, little power goes up to their heads, and there's nothing more than they like than that reflects in their power. So you just try to. In martial arts, you learn to deflect. You do not go head to head because there will always be somebody that's stronger than you. But if you, if it comes to you and you step to the side you're more likely to do well. Same principle. Common sense. Bottom line. I'm in Haiti now. This guy, he overthrew Aristide. The, the U.S. government helped this overthrow happen. As a matter of fact, I have photos of American soldiers on the streets of Haiti and uh, in tanks and, you know, fully armed. And, and, the, and, I, and that very same day, my wife's like, you know, the U.S. government is saying that they have no forces, no, no forces in, in, in Haiti. I'm like, all right. So anyhow, so this, so this is how I picture Fidel arriving in Havana in 1959, after the revolution, the rebel leader surrounded it, so it was an iconic photo. And, but you know, not everybody was happy about it, some people were protesting. And by the way, I apologize for the graphic nature of some of the photos that show up here, but that's life. You know, it happens, it happens. I, it is not my job to decide what's gonna get published, my job is to document it. The, actually, I wasn't talking about this. This is, for us, this, this might be like, ooh, we, is it okay to photograph a woman topless? Guess what? I stepped on the scene. I have my camera. I looked at her. She said hi. Like, oh, fine. So I, I kind of, it was more because she was a woman. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to do with it because she was topless. But that was a tacit. And this is, a, this is a, oh, some other time in Haiti. But poor Haiti is always suffering. That's what I was talking about. So even in the middle of chaos, I'm always looking for composition. I'm always looking for how do I make, how do I, like literally, in my mind it wasn't about a, a body in front of me and it was gory, it was how do I, how do I best tell the story, you know, and then this guy pointed to the hole in this guy's head and that was the photo. So, look, I am not a, I'm not a religion practicing, religious person as far as dogma, but I certainly believe there's got to be some sort of mighty power. Uh, something, something that orchestrates everything, and I truly believe I have a guardian angel because I've been too close to dying too many times, and this is one of those times. So I'm in Haiti, shots start getting fired, we hear an idiot journalist running to, everyone starts running, but we all run in, but you don't want to work, you don't want to be working next to each other, especially if you're photographers, because you want to be on your own, you want to get the shots, you are competing one way or another, you want to, you want a better shot. But the common sense dictates that you, you kind of still have to stay in small groups in case something happens. So I'm following a Spanish cameraman, a young intern from the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, and this me. Fifteen minutes earlier, the journalists were making fun of me because I was no one wearing the bulletproof vest because I promised my wife that I was going to this mess, I'd wear my bulletproof vest. I'm like, oh, you guys go to hell. I promised my wife. So, and, and they thought it was funny. So there's the three of us. I'm the only one with a bulletproof vest. And the Spaniard is in the middle of the street, you know, walking nonchalantly with his camera. And the poor kid behind it's like, you know, he doesn't know, but he's following this guy. And I'm hugging the walls. I literally, I'm going very slow. I'm looking at my, my head is on the swivel. I'm paying attention to everything. And all of a sudden, I feel somebody grab my arm and pull me back. And I turn around. And this tiny Haitian man, uh, he's the, one of the darkest skinned person I've ever met. And he's got a white beard white hair and he's dressed all in white and he's just looking at me I'm like huh I think you're trying to protect me thanks man but I gotta go because he held me back now I'm further away from these people and about a block or so later same thing same guy grabs my arm pulls me back more vehemently I turn around like I, I, I think you're trying to protect me but if I'm here I have to do my job so thank you but I gotta do this at this point he just kind of shakes his head and rolls his eyes and I take two steps, turn around to thank him one more time, and he's gone, he's not there. So because of that, all of a sudden I hear shots to the right. And instead of going this way, I go down the street and I end up in the middle of this chaos where the soldier got shot in the foot, and they're still shooting at us, and the guy in the back is actually guarding the, guard, the back, the rear guard shooting, and I'm running backwards taking this photo, and they're falling, it's chaos, but I'm still shooting. And I get the whole sequence. Eventually I get him when he gets put in the back of a pickup truck. So I have the whole sequence, and I, you know, I go back, when it's all done, I go back to where the journalists gather, 
and everybody said, there's a turmoil going, and they say, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, who are you with? I'm like, I was with the kid and the Spaniard. I said, well, we heard that somebody got shot. We gotta go find out, because it's an unspoken rule. When you're in a theater of war, chaos like that, you, you watch out for each other. You don't wanna be left in a Haitian hospital. That's just not a good thing. So eventually, uh, we went to different places. I ended up going to like the Swedish clinic, and there, out of an OR, I walk in, just in our, here comes a, a surgeon all covered in blood. He's got a back on his hand, he said, here, you're a journalist, here. I'm like, what is it? So it's from the spine. They had a, a hole about this big in one side and a hole about this big. And it's all frayed and covered with gore. That was the spine. He got shot right in the chest, right where the bulletproof vest would have protected you. The kid got shot three times, and uh, right by his ear, right in the trap, and right in the shoulder. His name is Doherty, uh, for the Sun Sentinel. He, I just found him after many, many years. I never knew who he was, but I found him. So the point is, only because that guy held me back, I survived that day because they got caught in the crossfire. So we have, we have about five minutes left. All right, that so means five minutes sure for you guys. So let's make sure we have any more questions. All right. Were you scratching your head or were you raising your hand? Actually, somebody decided. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you have any boundaries you put up for yourself? Do I have any boundaries that I put up for myself as far as what? So the more, the more I learn about what I do or what I used to do full time, the more you realize that at the end of the day, you need to keep your compassion always at the forefront of whatever you do. You need to care for your subject and you need to think what would happen if I were in their shoes. So I always think of those terms. And just as I was telling in the interview prior, if I have to choose between making a photo and saving a life, very likely that I'm going to save a life. Or very likely that I'm going to grab somebody, get him out of the way while I'm shooting with the other hand. I will try to do both. But the moment I do that, then I can no longer cover that person's life because I affected it. At the end, look, your moral values, your moral compass is whatever you can live with after nobody else is watching and you have to go to bed and you got to think about it. Are you, would you have done something that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life because you could have saved a life, but instead you decided to take a photo and make an name for yourself or did you do the humane thing to do? So it's up to you. It's up to you. Uh, hold on, now this side. Hey, dude with that hair. <laughs> uh, what do you shoot on? And whenever you're in like a limited mobility space, like for example, like border zone, does that affect what you bring to the... As far as what? I'm sorry. Uh, like what you shoot on and what lenses you bring. Oh, are you talking about my gear? Yeah. So I always have two cameras with me. On the, on the right side will be my wide-angle zoom, on my left side will be my telephoto, because that way I don't have to think. I simply know that this lives here and this lives here. And I always have a uh, backup somewhere where I can get to, hopefully. But uh, you do not run a marathon with brand new shoes. You go to a situation like that with what you're familiar with. The last thing you want is for you to be chimping with your camera in the middle of a firefight while you should have been taking photos. You're going to get shot. Great question. So when you're on the field taking photos, how much time do you spend actually talking so the question is how much time do you spend time how much time do you spend with the people that you photograph uh, in situations like that and she's referring specifically to the woman the young woman on the gravesite usually you use your common sense and you let the situation handle itself she just wanted to give her name she told me he, she was one of Rachel's best friends and then she was so overwhelmed with pain and grief that she just walked away. That's it. Had she wanted to say more, I would have. But, it's, uh, but remember, I'm a photographer. I tell the stories through photos. Uh, usually journalists will actually sit down with her afterwards and, and under different circumstances and get more out of her. But at that moment, it was all about getting a what, when, where, why, how. So the question is about my bubble perspective. So the way you see the world through eye level at about 50, 55 millimeter, which is your normal vision without counting peripheral vision, is called your bubble perspective. You see the world through here. If you walk around with your phone and you take a photo from that same perspective, you are just blinking with your device or your camera for that matter. 
So right off the bat, it's not that interesting. So you got to think of those terms. You got to jar the brain into create, get thinking that it's seeing new things. But if you're aware of your bubble of perspective, sometimes I walk into a place, I walk into a scene where there are many options for me to photograph. There is no time for me to go try the options. But I know at this stage in my life, I can take this bubble of perspective and I can throw it places. I can tell you exactly how a photo is going to look if I put my camera in between you two, if I put my camera by your feet, if I put it in that corner, if I put it over here. So in my mind, I already have the possibility so I can go straight to what I think is going to be the best option at that moment. And if I have more time, I'll try more options. But you need to train yourself to do that. And there's an, there's a, I teach this a lot. If I, those that play with your phone and with your camera, you know, there is, in my case, there is, this is my lens, my two goal lens, my wide angle lens. I'm so used to seeing through it that if I close my eyes, I can picture the wide angle. You are familiar with whatever device you're using to the point that if you close your eyes, you can do that. So if I were to tell you, put that phone or that device uh, seven feet up, three feet back, pointing down to the back of your head and describe the scene, you probably can describe it, but you're probably going to say, oh, it's the back of your head. And no. It's the, the gray cap. It's my shoulders. It's the ground. It's his feet. It's her, her sweater. And, and you need to train your mind into seeing the details that are there, but we tend, tend to just not pay attention to it. Because when you start thinking in terms of details, you can, you can pre-visualize what you might get. At the beginning, what you think you're going to get is here, and when you end up getting it's here. But eventually, as you practice, they come together and they become one. So I can walk into any room and I immediately know where I need to be. And that's just experience. It's just experience. Esprit, we are out of time. It is 12.35. Right. So I want to thank you so much for joining us.